Hi everybody, this is Ashley with Ashley Says So. I am back with another Old Hollywood Scandals video. This video today is gonna be about Miss Phyllis Hyman. And girl, I don't know how to pronounce your name, so I'm not gonna butcher it, but you know who I'm talking to. Where you at, girl? Get in here. You have been waiting for this Phyllis Hyman video for forever and a day, and finally it's here, so get your tail in here. One more thing, guys, before we start. I know y'all ready to get to the tea. I have been getting several messages from people who are wanting to see the Aretha Franklin intro. So what I'm going to do is leave a link in the description to my Instagram page. There you will be able to see all of the intros that I've ever done. And also there will be a few of my comedy videos mixed in there. You guys are going to be able to see the other side of me. Uh, all right, let's get to the scandalous tea. Phyllis Hyman was born on July 6, 1949. She was the eldest of seven children and she was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to Philip, a World War II veteran, and Louise Hyman, a waitress at a local nightclub. Her music training started at a music school and on graduation, she performed on a national tour with the group New Direction, and that was in 1971. After the group disbanded, she joined All The People and worked with another local group called The Hundo Beach. In 1974, she appeared singing in the film Lenny. It was around this time that she also did a stint leading her own band called Phyllis Hyman and the PH Factor. Now in 1977, Phyllis was working on her first album and she had signed with a company called Buddha Records. Arista Records bought Buddha Records out. So then Phyllis just transferred over to the Arista label and they finished her first album there. And it was called somewhere in my lifetime, and it was released in 1978. And around this time, y'all know what started happening, honey. The scandal, child. The scandal. Now, Phyllis was doing a lot of things. Yes, she was just trying to get herself out there, so she was uh, doing different interviews. She posed for Playboy. Um, I'm putting some of the images up right now. She did an interview with Playboy. She was just basically living as a free spirit, trying to get herself out there any way she could. And then she got married to her manager, Larry Alexander. I don't think that she was ever really happy in their relationships. I don't think Phyllis was ever happy. Um, You know, let's just get more into it. Clive Davis at the time basically was Arista Records. You know what I mean? He was churning out pop stars like that. Uh, he had worked with Aretha Franklin, uh, plenty of people. And when he found Phyllis Hyman singing her heart out, he felt that he had found a jewel. The only problem is that he felt he found a jewel that he can switch to pop instead of staying with soul. And Phyllis Hyman, in her heart, she was a soul singer. She was Mother Earth, you know what I mean? And Clive wasn't really looking for that. He felt like, okay, that's good, that's cool, but the records that sell are pop records. And I hate to say it, he was right. He was right. But Phyllis kind of felt like that was selling out. You know, she didn't really want to do that. So what she did do is she ended up putting out like one pop song, which was called You Know How to Love Me. Now this song made it to the R&B Top 20 and it also performed well on the dance club chart. And Clive was trying to steer her in this direction. He's like, Phyllis, you see, this song did well. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get more pop. You know, times are changing. You know, that soul stuff is good, but that's just not what we need right now. And Phyllis was like, no. She even disobeyed Clive. He told her that he did not want her to perform in a Broadway play called Sophisticated Ladies. He did not want her to perform in that because he was working on her image. She told Clive once again, F you, I'm about to do what I want to do. And she went ahead and she started in that play. That though was a great move because she got rave reviews. People loved her in that play. But you know, her attitude was bad. I don't know if any of this is fact. I'm just telling you what I researched. Seems like to me, and she said herself, matter of fact, ain't no seems like if Phyllis said herself, she wanted to record the dang on music that she felt like she should record, and she felt like he was selling her short. She did not want to become a pop diva. She wanted to sing like Anita Baker, you know what I'm saying? So she became difficult to work with. She um, started, you know, not showing up for shows on time, you know, or just not showing up at all, not wanting to leave the dressing room. And Clive just basically was saying enough was enough. And he wanted to punish her for this behavior. So when she tried to put out later songs or other songs, you know, he would hold them to not put them out and, you know, not ask her back to the studio. Basically just, just holding her time. So her little fanfare that she had 
would die down before she could really put out anything else that was a smash hit. So since she was arguing so much and pushing back so much, Clive's attention started going elsewhere. All of a sudden, there was this new girl coming up from New Jersey who could sing her little panties off. And you know, that was Whitney Houston. So it was like, whoa, wait a minute. Well, see, now, you know what? You was doing too much, Phyllis. And now here's this girl that can sing. And I, in my opinion, Whitney Houston sings better than Phyllis Hyman. I am not saying that Phyllis Hyman cannot blow because the girl can blow, but this is just my opinion. Do not get mad at me over my opinion. I think Whitney can sing better than Phyllis Hyman. So obviously Clive did as well and Whitney was easier to work with. She was a teenager. She's very eager, uh, beautiful, supermodel. And although Phyllis Hyman was beautiful, look at the pictures that I'm putting up. I mean, clearly the lady was, woo, you know. Uh, Whitney used to let Clive take the reins. If you guys watch closely, Whitney Houston, when she first came out, did not look like the Whitney Houston of, oh, I want to dance with somebody. Yes. You know, she was not singing those songs. She was singing more soulful songs as well when she first came out. But Clive steered her in that direction. And he basically told her, hey, if you want to achieve superstardom, let me take you there. And Whitney obliged. She let him take her there. So Clive started taking his attention off of Phyllis. You know, she just, it, she time is money, time is money. And he felt like she was wasting his time. And for a while, like I said, Clive had her on pause. He had her on hold. Now, while she was on hold, she was trying to do songs for like little jingles for commercials and things like that. But there was nothing really that she was getting that was making her a lot of money. So eventually things came to a head, of course, between Phyllis and Clive. And she ended up cursing him out, letting him know what it was, telling him that she did not need him. And she went on her way. From my research, I don't know if this is true or not. This was the biggest mistake Phyllis Hyman felt that she had made in her life. After this, things did not go well for Phyllis. She was able to still do shows, you know, and she still released some music, but just nothing significant. She did not achieve the superstardom fame that she wanted. And this put her on a path of drugs, cocaine. She had used before, you know, she had already started using, but now she was getting on it heavy. She was doing cocaine. She was drinking. She may have been experimenting with other drugs. She also sank into a very, very deep depression because of where her career was going. Like I said, the marriage with her husband was never really good, so she started to take lovers. Now, one of these people that Phyllis was dating on and off was Christopher Williams. You remember him? But I don't know if I would call it dating because also her best friend was sleeping around with Christopher. She was cool with it. Her and her best friend was laughing about it. You know, high five and girl, you had him, I had him too. It was Christopher that was getting played because he had no idea that the two women knew each other. He didn't know that they were friends. So they were both sleeping with him. So this time he was the bust down Tatiana. She took male and female lovers. The friend of hers made it very clear in an interview that he did that Phyllis Hyman did not identify as lesbian. She was strictly heterosexual or that's the way she identified, but she did have relationships with women. As a matter of fact, that is a part of the reason that she and her husband divorced because her husband found out that she had slept with a very big name celebrity. They ended up leaving, they ended up splitting up. I do not know who this celebrity is. I'm just telling you what I read. But Phyllis Hyman was always looking for love. And she was very difficult. She was a difficult person, not only with Clive, but with anybody. And a lot of these issues came with the drugs and depression is because Phyllis Hyman was bipolar. And when you are bipolar, you are very manic. You know, you're very, very happy at some times and you're sad at other times. So that's the way she was with people, especially with her lovers, especially with her lovers. She was very much in love at one point. Then next thing you know, she's somewhere drinking and crying, talking about, I hate you, throwing bottles everywhere, cursing whoever the person is that she's with at the time, cursing them out, acting a fool because of the bipolar, the mental illness that she had. And she felt so unloved. This was just a comment that I read. But this girl said that Phyllis Hyman came and she sang at her high school. The girl was wondering, like, why is Phyllis Hyman here? And let me tell you why she was there. This is at a time when she was on pause when Clive Davis had put her behind on Pauls for not doing what he said. So she was even singing at high schools. Anyways, she's singing at the high school. After the show, the girl comes up and is like, oh my God, Phyllis Hyman, I love you. She turned around to her and was like, thank you. 
Like, you know, like, thank you. Like she couldn't believe that somebody would love her this much or, or look up to her this much. You know, it's like all of the love that everybody was giving her and pouring out to her, she just was having such a hard time receiving receiving and then she started gaining weight got very very big you know and she was already a very big tall stout woman so with that weight on her some of the men used to say derogatory remarks to her you know basically telling her that she looked like the man you know you're bigger than us that type of behavior so she was dealing with a lot she really was now it is said that phyllis hyman also had two abortions and that ate her up badly because she ended up wanting children later on before her day. She wanted anybody. She wanted somebody to love her. Let's go back to her lesbianism. She had a seven year relationship with a woman. That ended badly. That is also said to have played a part in her death. So now we get to this point. Phyllis Hyman, the great singer, the beautiful woman that's been in Playboy. She's been just that close to the top. She was signed with Arista had a great chance and she knows that she ruined it for herself, okay? She's throwing her body out there because she's so desperate for love. She's lost her husband, whom I don't think she was ever happy with anyway. So, you know, I'm trying to put you in the mindset of the woman. She's suffering with a mental illness. She's bipolar. And throughout all of these years that nobody knew about is that Phyllis Hyman was trying to commit suicide. As a matter of fact, she had got on the Arsenio Hall show and she said that she thought about jumping out of a window. But she said what stopped her is that what if she didn't die? Like, do you know how much pain that will be? So it's really a cry for help. And I don't know if people didn't take her seriously or if they tried, she just really pushed them away. She was difficult to people that loved her most. Life is just not what she thought it should be or would be for her. And it really wasn't what it could be for her. With her talent, with her looks, with her extreme voice, the success that she could have had, it really just kind of slipped through her grasp. And let me tell you one of the final blows to really push her over the edge. Waiting to Exhale had come out. She was told that she was being considered to be on the soundtrack. But she took it as she was promised to be on the soundtrack. Well, honey, somebody came up with the song, I'm Not Gonna Cry, and they heard Mary J. Blige sing it. And once they heard that, any chance Phyllis had, that blew her out of the water. She didn't have a chance anymore. And this hurt her because she, and she is a better singer than Mary J. Blige. She really is. You know, like I said, once again, this is my opinion. She is a much better singer than Mary J. Blige. But on that song, Mary J. Blige is that song. See what I'm saying? Some people make songs and some songs make people. In that case, I'm not going to cry. That is definitely a person making the song. Mary J. Blige made that song, baby. I mean, she tore that song up just all the time that I was loving you. Yes, you were busy loving yourself. Ooh, Lord. I would stop breathing if you told me to. But now you're busy loving someone else. Love. Like I said, once they heard that, that really blew Phyllis Hyman's chances. Any depression that she was in, this made it 10 times worse. And she could not pull herself out of it. She could not pull herself out of the black space. This is the crazy part about it. It was said that her family had kind of, they were able to keep up with her episodes. You see what I'm saying? So they were keeping up when she was high, when she was low. Since they knew that she had tried to commit suicide before and they knew the balance of her highs and her lows, they knew that she was on a low. They knew that. And she knew that they knew that she was on a low. So what she did to throw everybody off she planned a show and she started talking big cash money for this show you know calling folks girl i'm about to blow the roof off on this show baby they ain't seeing me they ain't seeing me sis because i'm gonna do the most on this show you know she's doing stuff like that you know people high-fiving and stuff yeah you know doing all that because she's piping them up hyping them up so even though they know that this is a time period where she's kind of on the low hey maybe not you know what i mean phyllis is calling everybody she's happy maybe everything is good matter of fact let's go see sis at the show tonight well y'all she never made it to that show matter of fact all of that that she did hyping everybody up was for show because she knew that all of the phone calls was trying to cheer her up you know trying to get her through whatever episode she was having she knew that she was going to get those so she planned ahead and she made it seem like she was on a high when she really was truly on a low. 
And that is really, that's really something else. That type of planning to throw people off that love you, love you with all their heart, support you. You planned to throw them off so you could successfully commit suicide. That is some almost alien feeling. You see what I'm saying? Like that is very in tune with yourself, your spirituality and the universe. That it's like that. That's pretty ironic that she was that in tune with herself, but still could not find happiness. And that was due to the bipolar mental illness. If she did not have bipolar mental illness, can you imagine how in tune I feel like she would have been a great success? I feel like she would still definitely be here. Whitney would have been up there, but she would have been up there too. But anyways, I'm sorry. Let me get back to it and let you know. She was supposed to have a show that night at the Apollo Theater. She's not answering the door. She's not answering the phone. Nobody's thinking suicide at this time. Because like I said, she's hyped everybody up to believe that everything is good. She's on a high. Well, they found her unconscious in her apartment bedroom at 2 p.m. She had always self-medicated. She overdosed on a mixture of a medicine called Tuanol and vodka. They actually rushed her to St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital. And that's where she died at 3.50 p.m. having never regained conscious. They went back to her room and they found a suicide note. And the suicide note said, I'm tired. I'm tired. Those of you that I love know who you are. May God bless you. I, I knew about Phyllis Hyman. I had heard of her before. I even watched her unsung years ago. But I guess I did not really know her like I knew the other old celebrities that I do on this list. You know, probably the one that's most closest to my heart is Frankie Lyman. Love him to death. But now after having done the research and looking at her and knowing her story, it touches me. It touches my heart. I hope you guys have a great night and I will be back soon with another old Hollywood scandal story. Thank you so much.